to me with all its vaunted pleasure. When you and you alone, Lord Jesus, are my treasure. You only, dearest Lord, my soul's delight shall be. You are my peace, my rest. What is the world to me? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. That hymn in particular is one of my guilty pleasure hymns. But I've got like a long list of guilty pleasure hymns. But this is one of them in particular. And one of the reasons is because the language is kind of tricky. What is the world to me? But even in the tonality and the, the, uh, uh, the actual singing of the hymn, the, it's really supposed to be semi-ironic. What is the world to me? It's not a serious question. It's more of a rhetorical device. It's not, what is the world to me? Somebody know? It's, what is the world to me? There are better things than the world that I seek. However, and as, as I was preparing the sermons for today, I kept going back and forth on two understandings of our parable. The one in particular in between the Pharisees grumbling that Jesus actually ate with sinners, if you can believe such a thing, and the woman with the ten silver coins. The parable of the lost sheep. So, since I couldn't make up my mind, I'm just going to do both of them. Firstly, when we ask the question of what is the world to me, we have to assume that at least one thinks it's a pretty good deal. One at least thinks the world has something better to offer. And so that's the one sheep or the one coin that goes and, and uh, has to be retrieved. But here's one very dangerous thing that Christians do, and we all do it, and we should not do it, but we do do it. And that's that we read ourselves into the text. Never read yourself into the text lest Jesus actually says your name. And here's why. I'm not going to ask for hands raised, but I can guarantee you that more than half if I were to ask you who you are in the parable, will say, I am the lost sheep. I'm the one that Jesus goes after. Just the law of probability says you're actually probably one of the 99. In fact, if you're here in church today, you're probably one of the 99. And that's not a boring thing. That's a very good thing. It's a faithful thing. Because when it, when it says that Jesus, the man, goes after the one sheep. He leaves all the others in open country. But he doesn't leave them all in open country saying, good luck to you, I hope you, I hope you do well, I've got to go get this one, and you go about your day and everything will be fine. No, Jesus is comfortable leaving those sheep because they are together, because they are a flock, and because they are faithful. They know the voice of the shepherd, so when the shepherd says, I go after this sheep, they say, we are together. We are a flock. We are a fold. And so even in open country, even in open country, and, and the reason that's in the text is because is to say they could wander anywhere into the world, but they don't. They stay together as flock, as church. And that's one thing that we at Augustana can really take to heart, especially on this side of COVID and having two services and all of that coming together as one in unity and in love and believing that the Lord will take care of us, even leaving us out in open country while he goes and he searches for the unrepentant, the one with no faith. And so we have this terrestrial or earthly understanding of this parable. We have the uh, understanding that, that the sheep actually stay where they are, and Jesus goes and finds the other sheep. Now here's a very interesting thing as well. And then I'll go to the other understanding of the text. When Jesus goes to the sheep, he does not lead the sheep to Christianity. And I want to make sure that I make this perfectly clear. 
Jesus does not lead Christians to, does not lead people to Christianity. He does not lead sheep with sheep treats, treats or sheep tricks or anything of the like. He does not lead people to Christianity. He grabs them and he puts them on his shoulders and he carries them to Christianity and he lays them in the flock and he says, now, my church is full. It's very passive understanding of the faith. Jesus grabs the sheep, puts them on his shoulders. It's not a, well, do you want to come? Here's an invitation. All you got to do is give your heart to the shepherd and you can come with me. No, he grabs the sheep and as he puts the sheep on his shoulders, all of the dirt and the mess and the sin has fallen off. Puts them on his shoulders, takes them back to the flock, lays him there, and all of a sudden, all of their wool is clean. What do we call that? Baptism. We call that baptism. And baptism is a violent action. When Christ declares, when Christ baptizes a child, he declares war on sin, death, and the devil. And he wins. 100% of the time. You may have heard me say oftentimes after a baptism that the water around the, the baptismal font is just the war zone. It's what you see that the victory is over. Or that, that the war is over and the victory is won. So we have that understanding of the text. Well, with that same understanding of the text of Christ putting someone on their shoulders and taking them to the flock, we also have the understanding of the church militant and the church triumphant. The church militant and the church triumphant. We, he, when we understand that there are a flock of people who are in heaven, who are awaiting their loved ones and looking to Christ, then we see Christ come along on this earthly militant plane. And he grabs the sheep and he puts them on his shoulders and he carries that sheep through life. Ups, downs, deaths, baptisms, birthdays, whatever it may be. And as he's carrying that sheep through this earthly plain, through the valleys and through the peaks, we have to remember, and this is probably the one place where footprints actually comes into play. Christ puts us on his shoulders and he walks us through the hills and the valleys. And as he does, we are comforted by the carrying. It's not painful for us the way that it was painful for Jesus. There we have the good shepherd. There we have the one who carries us along. And then when our time of dying comes, he lays that sheep into the earth. And as he lays down that sheep in his life here on earth, he picks it back up and he places it in heaven. And he says, behold, my sheep that was lost in sin has now died. And in dying, has been raised and in raising is in heaven where all my flock shall be. How beautiful of a text that is. And the point here is this, regardless of either of those interpretations. Now you see why I had to give you both. I just could not pick. But regardless, this is the main point. Jesus will get you. Jesus will carry you no matter what through thick and thin through the worst times in your life and through the best times in your life. He will get you. He will keep you in the faith. He will have you wrapped around His shoulders and you may feel the lows more than you feel the highs but more than likely you'll feel the everydays. 
And you'll forget, you will forget that Christ is carrying you. But He doesn't. He constantly carries your load. And as He does, He lays it down, completed, finished. That's why the best thing that a Christian can do is die, and die in Christ. Because when a Christian dies in Christ, Christ gives that Christian over to himself. And the Father looks at that Christian who has died, and he sees the Holy Spirit in that person, and he says on behalf of the shepherd, I cleaned the sheep. And now, he shall rest. Now, she shall rest. Now, the sheep are not 99 anymore, but 100. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now, may the peace which surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and minds of Christ Jesus now and forever. Amen.